Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner podcast. I am one of your hosts, Cody Stoffer. I am Simon Villanos. And I'm Liam Hughes. But we're back with another Last Chance You recap. We're going sequentially here. So we'll be talking episode two of the latest season at Laney College. And later on, we'll be talking about Rakeem Boyd running back over at Arkansas, all the things that he did well as a JUCO player, all the things that he did well or has done well up until this point at Arkansas, and what he needs to do to improve his draft stock for the NFL and where we see him landing and such. So in episode two of Last Chance U, they give us a quick recap on what Coach Beam means to the Oakland community. And there's also some trouble in paradise as they have a hard time recovering from a few injuries and some more question questions in the quarterback room and how they eventually overcome some of those things. So, Liam, what were some of your knee-jerk reactions to our viewing of the second episode of Last Chance U today? God, their quarterbacks suck. <laughs> You're not um, wrong. That, that That's my knee-jerk reaction. I should say that. That's my knee-jerk reaction. Obviously, they're all good athletes, and they all should know what they're doing, essentially. They all know the basics pretty well. Um, but, God, that quarterback room needs help. Mm -hmm. It just straight up needs help. I don't know. What, what more? What more do you want? I mean, you're not wrong. I'm going to be honest. I don't think I said this on the last episode, but... These quarterbacks, this quarterback room at Laney College is easily the worst quarterback room that has ever been on the show. And it's not even close. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest. It's, and you know, like, I'm not going to lie. There are flashes near the end. Um, spoiler alert. But like, not. Gosh, thanks, Simon. They're not redeemable <laughs> at all. Like, don't expect anything super special, I guess. No. I mean, they are not sustainable flashes that we've been seeing. You know. Yeah. Let's just say none of these guys are probably going to go D1. Well, dang. At least I mean, from, what, from what we've seen right now, like, do you think any of those guys could go D1? Kenny can't go D1 right now. No. Ken, no. I mean, being th being in a in a in a uh, in offense for three years and not knowing the playbook, Dude, you're not going to go. You're not going to go D1. I don't care how good you are. How, I don't care how raw you are. If you have that mental block, you're not going to go D1. Yeah. And nice. I, want, I, want, I want to talk about Kenny here in a second. But also, I want to see your guys' thoughts on how the starting quarterback got injured. It looked like he dove for the football during practice on a fumble. Is that... Am I mistaken on how that happened? Or was it during the rollout? I was kind of confused and... Liam was the one who thought that he was hurt diving for the football. I'm not yeah. really sure what happened. Is it Starting Simon quarterback, Ryan Mackey. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ryan Mackey. I mean, I thought he... So what? I, so I rewatched it today just so I could like take a closer look to a lot of things. And that was one of them. Because I wasn't sure what happened when I first saw it. But he dove on the football. And he was fine at first. But then this dude started rolling around and trying to like swing his legs into it or something. And someone definitely, well, he just got caught underneath a pile. It was a very preventable injury, to be honest. I don't know why he thought that was a good idea. And, like I respect it, but like, I don't know. Like, why are you going to roll around and on a pile and like just put yourself at risk like that? Like, I don't well, know. I to be honest. It wasn't the best move. Mentally. I just I just don't understand diving into a pile on a fumble during practice as the starting quarterback of really any team, honestly. Like, yeah, obviously you want that like hustle, but bro, you're the starting quarterback and the easiest place to get hurt during a practice is probably in a fumble scrum. And that's exactly what happened. So I think that that's like, you know, Obviously, they shouldn't be like rolling around and going all crazy in the pile, but like the quarterback needs to know better, I think, than to dive in the pile for that. I mean, what are you doing it for? You're not you're That's... not fighting for a position, right? You're not fighting for the ball even really because it's just it's a practice. So what are you doing it for? You're fighting it for your ego. 
at that point, I have to imagine. And that's just worth crap. It ain't worth crap. Yeah. I mean, I 100% agree. I mean, I don't know why. I, I don't know. I just, it wasn't a good idea either way. Like, he shouldn't have done it. So if y'all if y'all look closely, like they <laughs> they barely panned out when the ball got knocked out, but it was a pretty bad like I don't know what the running back was doing, but he was not holding on to the ball because it flew really high up into the air. So and he he looked like he wasn't ready for it. So there was a lot of things going on there. The practice was just not going well. So there you go. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean I don't know Kenny he. I mean, he had his chance, and I'm not gonna lie. I I don't know about y'all, but I felt like like he had, you know, he he was one of those diamonds in the rough. Like he could be someone that could come in, and if he's a raw talent, then he'll make some good plays, he'll make some bad plays. But he just ended up making bad plays. <laughs> I don't know what this dude really thinks that he has a post on every single play they call. Like, oh my god. Like you could look, watch it again, but this dude always says, I thought the post was open. I thought the post was there. But then <laughs> it's like, there's no post there, Kenny. There's there's no post there. He keeps, I don't know, bro. No, it's a, it's a defense mechanism. He, he, he's trying to go with the uh, the most common denominator. And he's trying to... Is it really? That's that's what I have to imagine. I mean, he's, he's going for the thing that he thinks he's going to get away with. You know, he's, he thinks that the coach is going to to just kind of blow him off for saying that the post is there because there's probably a post route on probably say 60% of his of his uh, throws but I'm I'm not sure I don't know I don't know what the coaching staff sees in this guy he's been in the program for two to three years and he doesn't even know the playbook or he's not like he's not holding himself accountable at all like you know, I, dude, his interview drove me nuts. He's like, yeah, I, I think that the offense is more dynamic when I'm at quarterback, bro. You don't even know the plays. What do you mean? The offense is more dynamic. You don't know what they're running half the time. Y'all scored 10 points in a game, 10 points. And anytime it mattered, anytime a play had to be made, you didn't know what the play was. You didn't know the situation on fourth and long. He's holding onto the ball forever. And he ends up running for like a couple of yards and he's nowhere near the first down. And on the last play of the game, he gets sacked and he gets strip sacked. So I just, KJ is a terrible quarterback. I don't think, I don't see him having any chance at playing football. No, let alone at Laney for the rest of the season. I don't know if that's going to change when he gets healthy, but I just, and I certainly don't see him going and playing anywhere else. Like he's just, and he didn't show me anything in that practices of that second episode. He hasn't shown me anything mentally and he didn't show me anything in the game to make me think that he's going to get better either. Like, and that's really worrying because he has a lot of work to go and it seems like he just hasn't gotten any better. So, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm not holding back any anything on KJ. I don't oh my gosh. Like Yikes. he can't make a read to save his life. First off, he can't make good throws to save his life. And it, KJ was the entire reason they were 0-2. Like, I feel like the coaches have really tried, and they've had to have tried everything for the past two to three years to get something out of him, even a shred of hope that he could develop into anything and he doesn't. And then his reckless play and him holding onto the ball too long is kind of what ends up getting him hurt. And not only is he a liability to the team, but he's also a liability to himself by not knowing what's going on. And, and sure. I think that had a huge part to play in his injury. Yep. <laughs> I definitely agree. I here, I don't know if y'all remember the scene, but in the game, uh, Coach Beam, he was all like, man, KJ, his brain power is just so limited. I remember at the time thinking like, dang, that's kind of, <laughs> that's, that's really insulting, but. That was the he nicest right way though. I've ever heard anyone call someone else stupid. That was <laughs> a, as, yeah, that was as nice as he could have gotten there. I would have just, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel bad because I don't want to rip on this dude because he's just trying to follow his dream, but it's like. Oh, what are you doing like outside of practice? Are you studying the playbook? Like, I'm gonna be honest, if you're the backup, you should already know the playbook because you're not in there getting reps, so you should know this playbook inside out. 
if you don't even know the playbook, then forget reads. You don't even know the play. So especially after two to three years, like, yeah, that too. Oh, it's, it's, I could not imagine this. It's unimaginable. The situation that Laney was put into when KJ had to step up and play quarterback. So that, that set me off. (laughs) I mean, shout out to the defense though. They stepped it up the second game. I thought they played much better. Well, Rajon could have played a little bit better, but he's, he's, you know, he's getting into form getting into form yeah um, and i think we i mean we could definitely talk about that as well yeah. talk about just you know mentally giving up on certain plays and not taking every play seriously yeah he's he's one of those that needs to ease into it kind of but i don't know if he wants to make it to the next level and i know we all know he can like we've seen this dude practice like he's a beast you know oh, he's a baller. He moves really well oh yeah so it's more of a matter of him just oh here's oh my god there's the inner teacher in me but it's more of a matter of him applying himself (laughs) (laughs) i mean you're not wrong though you're not wrong yeah but it is though because like we know what he could do he has fantastic hands he's very smooth um hip wise you know he has very fluid hips and so you like he could be really aggressive playing the ball but i don't know sometimes it's it's just not there you know but we could talk about that more because there are two games in this season or sorry in this episode so yeah i think i think i said everything that i needed to say about the game and basically kj that was that's the summary of that second game of the season kj happened so Anyways, KJ got hurt and he never played again. So there. <laughs> spoiler so there alert. Oh, well, it's not that big of a spoiler because, I mean, the guy that they picked to be the emergency quarterback was none other than Dior Walker Scott. And he kind of, well, not kind of, he played absolutely out of his mind in that game. There's a big difference between how Dior was preparing how kj was preparing and maybe that's just how they framed it in the documentary like i'll I'll give it that but could definitely tell that dior was picking it up way easier in the two or three days he was named quarterback than kj did in two or three years so i mean i don't know that might say more about dior but i don't know what do y'all think about dior walker scott dude's a baller absolute dude is a baller yeah. <laughs> yeah so, I mean, and go on. I was so I have in my notes. So I was kind of going off of my reactions to the episode sequentially. I put Dior at quarterback, and then halfway through the game, I scratched out at, and I put in all caps for quarterback, and put an exclamation <laughs> point on that because, oh Love my it. gosh, he played out of his mind. He threw more touchdowns in like that one game. He was responsible for more touchdowns in that one game than like the other quarterbacks through the first two games. Like, bro, yeah. they really scored over 60 points on this team. And like, I don't know how good uh, Feather River College or whatever was or is. They were the only unranked team that they faced so far, but they really needed to win that game. And they really yes. needed to win the way that they did. And I was also pleasantly surprised at how that run game took off, especially you know, after watching a lot of film and talking to you, Simon, about how Juco is really pass heavy, especially in that California league. And mm-hmm. for their run game to be as strong as it was between the tailback and Dior was just amazing. And Dior is, oh my gosh, that kid is an athlete, like absolute beast. And I think coach beam said it better than anybody is like Dior is just somebody who's willing to do whatever it takes for the team. Like, bro, he hates his job. He's, homeless and like he's just in a really tough spot you know and his his family misses him they showed that a little bit you know like he's got a lot going on and he still pours himself into the team and makes plays and makes the team better so that was it was nice to have something that wasn't so frustrating to watch but actually like inspiring in this episode yeah no doubt i mean I don't know about y'all, but I got some goosebumps once that once that music picked up. Oh my gosh, what song was it? It was uh, a too short song. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, it was. 
Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> you might have to play a little clip here, but not not too much because YouTube gets weird about it. But yeah, <laughs> once that song started playing, like I got goosebumps because he just went off and he was electrifying. That little hurdle into the end zone got me all hyped. I was like, let's go. That's what you want though. Like you want a guy that like not only embodies like the soul of the team but he embodies like the hard work that all of y'all put in and is still disciplined enough to utilize all of that to be great and to win most importantly you know and that's the your walker scott and you know he may not be the tallest guy or you know i guess the most talented skilled type of guy but you know physically and just mentally like he's he's that dude for sure you know like we talked about dakota allen in the last um episode of playmakers corner you know he's kind of, he just kind of has one of those personalities that like you know he's a good locker room guy you know maybe he's not i guess i don't know like the same kind of guy as dakota allen but he's the kind of guy that'll inspire you that'll get you going because i don't know if y'all remember in that first game that they played but he was the one yelling at his team and was like hey you know all the playing around gotta stop because look what happened but, like it ends today is what he was saying and you know they they, you know, they tuned up a little bit in that second game. It was still kind of a close game, to be honest. So it wasn't that bad of a loss, but they still went 0-2. And then this one was a much-needed game. They blew up for 60 points. The run game took off. And, I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there. You know, those running backs aren't – I'm not going to say they're the worst running, running backs in Last Chance U. But they're pretty – I mean, they, they might be pretty close. It might – they. I don't know. Y'all will have to see for y'all selves for sure. But the fact that they were going off, I feel like was in huge part to Dior Walker Scott just being, honestly, just being a threat as a running quarterback. Am I wrong there? Uh, what do y'all think? Liam, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're completely right. I mean, if you if you don't feel comfortable in your, in your passing game, then you at least have to have a running game. And that's what he brought to the game for them. You know, he, he brought a running game and he brought... A, a doubt for the defense like who's gonna run it who's gonna run it who's, who's it gonna be this time and now suddenly instead of two threats for one and a half really which is like a passing threat and then maybe half of a running game right now there's kind of like two and a half there's kind of a passing game and then that that expanded into actually being a passing game and there's oh the quarterback could run it and the running back can run it oh. so it gives the defense a almost too much to think about especially not being able to really practice for it and have film on it uh going into the game so i think that you know even though he is 5'8 even though he is primarily a receiver even though he is a good receiver you know he he said in in the show i can do it all i can do it all mm -hmm. which is you know that's what you want to hear and yeah. he did it all and he, his throws were great. I mean, they were very catchable balls. Maybe they weren't perfect throws, but they were all catchable. Um, he put some in, in some contested territory, so he trusted himself. He trusted his receivers. And they, it paid off. They, they uh, responded to that trust with, with numbers, with points. He definitely got lucky on a couple of those throws. Oh, though, he definitely not did. Lie. But you know, you got <laughs> you got contested, and I was thinking of that jump ball he threw into triple cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> contested <laughs> is certainly a word. But hey, he Liam's right. Um, still beat. I mean, if you don't yeah. tr if you don't trust your receivers to make that play, then You're right, <laughs> then they won't trust you to to throw that ball. You know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't know. But, maybe you shouldn't. I mean, maybe you shouldn't trust your receiver to make that play. But like, <laughs> you know, get the coach's voice out of your ear, man. Yeah, for sure. But it was good seeing it happen. And I mean, I don't know about y'all. I, but like, there was one thing of this episode that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But remember when all of those assistant coaches were at the bar talking about who to put at quarterback? They brought up Dior. And this was before you know he was even given the chance. But. Or like, okay, so if Dior played quarterback for the rest of the year, do you think he'd get an offer to a D1 school? And they're like, no. And that kind of like, <sighs> I know he had film from the previous season, but I mean, I don't even know how much film that might be, but that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But also at the same time, it did make me respect Dior a little bit more because I feel like there's no way he 
like understood or how should i say this there's no way he didn't understand that this might hurt his chances at going to a better college or just getting out of california which is what he says a lot throughout the season but how did y'all feel about that statement i personally felt like I don't think they meant any disrespect towards Dior, but I think that's a reflection of how the system works, you know, that he he really would he would benefit way more from playing receiver for the whole year, you know, as far as getting a good offer and a good scholarship that would put him in a good place, you know, so right. I I didn't take it like personally on like behalf of Dior, you know, and I think that the coaches have a lot of respect for him. But, you know, I think that they they understand that, you know, putting him in this situation where, you know, there's no timetable of return for any of these quarterbacks that, you know, it might it's it's probably going to hurt him to play quarterback. So yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how Liam felt, but that's I I didn't get rubbed the wrong way, but I feel like it showed like an understanding amongst the coaches, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't think, my bad, I didn't mean it like that. Like, I meant, like, for Dior, like, I felt, like, kind of bad, you know, because the way it sounded, and, like, look, I don't blame the coaches at all because they made really good points. The way it sounded was, like, like he was kind of, like, the sacrifice because what they also said is that, well, you know, nobody else is going to get an offer if we don't pick it up. Dior might be the only guy that could do it. So, you know, it's either Dior doesn't possibly... I mean, they didn't rule it out completely. So they said it's either Dior doesn't possibly get an offer to an ideal school or nobody does. No. So, yeah. uh, so that's how I took it. I didn't take it offense like that. I just took it like, well, Dior is definitely the only one here that is sacrificing a lot or one of the ones that is sacrificing a little bit more than everybody else, you know? I think it's a realistic statement. I mean, he's he is 5'8". He is... Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how many quarterbacks in college who are five eight make it to the NFL. I'm just gonna go ahead and guess none. Um, but that that holds him back. You know, if he if even if he does ball out as as a quarterback, that's quarterback film going to a D1 school. That's not receiver film, which is actual chance, right? So even if he balls out the whole season and even if he takes them to a, a championship and wins it that's that's not going to a d1 school and them being su- well maybe i mean maybe a, a college would would take a, a 5-8 quarterback honestly but that's not what he wants right ultimately oh maybe he wants to win yes maybe he wants to serve the team yes but ultimately looking forward into his career this isn't what he wants. So he is making that sacrifice. And he, they, I think the coaches are trying to be cognizant of that. And they're trying to be uh, respectful of that. So I think that, I mean, I understand that it, it does rub you the wrong way because it, it sucks. And it's part of the, uh, it's just part of the, the culture of college football and especially football in general. But, you know, you got to be realistic about it at some point. Sure. They made the right call, I still think. You know, I mean, they didn't have a choice. Right. It was one of those things. I mean, obviously, Dior could have said no and then quit, but, like, he wasn't going to do that, you know? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all I got to say about this episode. How are y'all feeling so far? Is is the hype getting bigger? What? Or, or what? I enjoyed the second episode way more. And I, I'm still eager to see how Rajon progresses because he was still kind of lazy in that last game. And he's not making as many plays as I kind of expected from his introduction and his swagger of the first episode. So I'm excited to see that development and see where this quarterback room goes. All right. What about you, Liam? I agree. I mean, the it's a, quarterback controversies are always going to be the, the hottest topic in football, you know, no matter what is happening with the rest of the team um so it's interesting just as a base and i think it's pretty cool i'm excited for it i'm excited Sweet. to watch more so do y'all want dior to continue to be quarterback 
I hope that they find, you know, they get healthy. I feel like if Carson gets better, he could play because I want Dior to get into a better situation. So, yeah. okay. Well, you, Liam. I agree. I, I hope that Carson can get better and Dior gets himself into a better situation for his own future, for his own personal life. All right. Oh. But it is, it is cool. It's always cool to see, you know, somebody develop in a way that, you know, maybe going into the future, he could run some wildcat plays. He could he could play quarterback in some off packages and and uh, or maybe do some like flea flickers to the wider to the wide receiver. Yeah, absolutely. That's the kind of film that, you know, makes uh, <laughs> that encourages. Right. Which is to call those plays. Yeah, because I mean, a college or an NFL team, they're never going to consider Dior to be a to be a quarterback, but they yeah. might be able to consider him in kind of one of those versatile roles where he's a threat. You know, maybe if if you don't know where the ball is, look for Dior. Maybe That's you'll true. find it. Yeah, he could potentially be a Taysom Hill type. You never know. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely being becoming a thing, but yeah. All right. So, is there anything else I'll have to say, or be good? I'm good. I'm good. Sweet. All right. Well, speaking of last chance, you we're gonna continue on our theme of JUCO player breakdowns, and we're gonna talk about Rakeem, the Dream Boy, arguably one of the best players to ever on last chance you, and actually continue to be successful. Coming up next. What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner. Here, we're going to do another breakdown of yet another Juco player from Last Chance U as well. From season... Oh my gosh, I got to think about this. From season three of Last Chance U, the first season at Indy Community College, Independence Community College. Uh, we're talking about Rokeem the Dream Boyd. This guy was a beast while he was there. He was actually in a pretty crowded backfield when he was at... Uh, Indy, he had, oh my gosh, he had Kingston Davis, who had to compete with, who was a Michigan bounce back. He committed to Michigan and then came to Indy. Then he had Jamal Scott, who I don't think he went to a college before. He was just somebody looking for a better opportunity. But he ended up being really good for Indy and kind of being a, a black horse in that little running back group that they had there. You know, he was, he was a sleeper for sure. And he did end up going D1 as well, Jamal Scott, that is. Well, here we are talking about Rakeem Boyd. He is arguably the most talented player to ever be on Last Chance U. Um, his his backstory, it's I wouldn't say it's as like turbulent as some of these other backstories on Last Chance U, because there's plenty of really good stories, but it's still pretty interesting. So he did originally commit to Texas AM. He spent one year there, and uh I don't think he was in any real trouble. He just I don't know he just really didn't like the opportunities there for him so he decided to go to independence community college and play for the famed coach jason brown who by the way y'all will find this out when we get to independence but he is definitely one of the best recruiters in the country no doubt because he recruited a whole ton of d1 talent and jason brown definitely has a reputation because i mean I, I don't doubt these numbers but at the time at the time he was at Indy, he was sending 30 to 40 players back to Division One, and none of them ever got kicked Damn. out of school. So that's crazy. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. that's how good, you know, you got to be to go to Independence and play for this team. But anyways, here we are. We're going to talk about Rakeem Boyd and his Juco film first. So let's talk strengths. Um, Do one of y'all want to start talking about the six foot, 215 pound running back? But Texas, in Texas. Cody, go ahead. This dude. <laughs> so, as far as strengths go for Rakeem Boyd after watching his Juco film, I'd say that first thing that stood out to me was he's very patient back. You know, he's willing to 
He's willing to wait for the holes. And, you know, I talked about this a little bit with Bison Robinson, but I'd say even more so with Rakeem Boyd. He's willing to hang out in the backfield for as long as it takes. And I'd even say, like, it, this is another strength that I put down for him, but it kind of goes hand in hand is, you know, he just needs one cut and he could be off to the races. I feel like he was severely outclassing people by being at independence and it was borderline unfair. And then another thing that I really liked about Rakeem Boyd at independence was he has excellent running like technique. You know, he pumps his arms very well and he gets his legs up really high. You know, he high knees it a lot. And I just think that, you know, obviously that's not something that you see a lot with running backs, but he's, he's, he has the same form of like a track athlete or like a long distance runner, depending on what run he's on and what play he's on. And I think that helps him be more of like a, a potential workhorse back. You know, I feel like his, his carry load has been pretty light so far between his career at independence and at Arkansas, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but yeah, I think that that'll extend his career, just his running technique, you know, and it'll make running easier and, he has a great stride. So those are some of, you know, I, I like to work in threes here with like the three strengths that jump out to me, either the fastest or his strongest strengths. And I'd say that his running form is probably some of the best that I've ever seen. And his one cut ability is super strong and he's very patient back. Yeah. I'll, I'll toss it over to Liam on what he thinks Rakeem Boyd's best strengths are. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, we, we watched the film together and I think both of us couldn't stop commenting about his, his running form, um, which is awesome. It's awesome to see. I think he's, he's even good in passing situations. You know, we, we didn't see a lot of like complex routes being run by him, but what he did run, he, he ran well and he caught the balls that were thrown his way. Um, we didn't, I don't know if we saw any like passes into coverage, uh, where he was being covered, but either way, you know, he's, he's, he's good at getting the ball and then making something happen with it, which is awesome. No matter where he is on the field. I do have to agree that he's probably the best single runner that we've reviewed so far. And... He he blew me away with it with his form. So those those strengths are pretty obvious. Watching his what's the word? His Ooh. film. Yeah, his film. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one hundred percent agree. You know he he was that dude for sure. And just to throw this out there because I don't think either of y'all know this. Or maybe not. Maybe I mentioned it once. But the Jayhawk Conference is the is the Kansas Juco Conference that, you know, Independence Community College is in. And that is considered to be, I mean, at least in my opinion it is. Like, obviously, with Juco's, it's hard to compare them all because there's different situations. But the Jayhawk Conference is definitely considered to be one of the best conferences in all of Juco. Like, it's the SEC of Juco's if there were any, to be honest, because there are just so many good players. And um, this is something that y'all will learn about in the later, or well, not the later, but in the Juco, or sorry, in the last chance you seasons before Laney. But in Kansas, there is no out-of-state limit for players that could come in and be offered scholarships and whatnot. So any out-of-state player could come in and there's no limit because most places – especially the south and you could uh connect the dots here <laughs> we allow up to 10 out of state players so there you go but this is most definitely one of the best ones and so when rakeem boyd was out there running and making plays he was doing it against some of the best like a lot of these players did go back to d1 d2 or something like that you know so it wasn't like he was playing against scrubs so if anything this is I guess I don't want to say the most legitimate Juco film, but like the competition he was playing against was pretty good. So that's a big plus for me. He was excelling against really good competition and whatnot. And I mean, I agree with all of y'all's strengths as well. Like his running form is amazing and he's kind of just naturally talented, to be honest. Like 
this dude has wheels for someone who's six foot two fifteen. Like I I don't know. Like I'm getting a real. It's really hard for me to figure out what this dude's forty is because he kind of just glides, you know. Like, yeah. D- does that make sense? Like kind of like an Eric Dickerson type of or Adrian Peterson type of gliding, you know. They're just a little bit taller, so it looks like they're slower, but they're they're going. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going like real fast, and so his top end speed, in my opinion, is pretty elite, and it shows when he does get to Arkansas as well. So yeah, that's those are the strengths I have to say about Rakeem Boyd. Um, also, you know, durability, that's another one. And I mean, honestly, he never really had any maturity issues. He's always been a pretty hard worker and whatnot. He just wasn't in the right situation at Texas A&M. So there's that. And yeah, I mean, you can't say that about a lot of Juco players, to be honest. So there you go. All right, so let's talk weaknesses. Do y'all mind if I go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, I mean, I can't blame him for this one. Like, I'm we're definitely nitpicking when it comes to some of these top end Juco prospects. But I felt like his agility could have been worked on a little bit more. I think Rakeem Boyd is a very one cut type of running back, which is cool. You know. But I don't know like sometimes i just i felt like he was a little stiff uh coming you know coming out of the handoff and whatnot and maybe he didn't have as much wiggle to him and maybe he doesn't have to because you know he's 215 with the 44 type of speed and i get it but i would have liked to see a little bit more agility out of him um you know in some of these juco games for sure because there are definitely times you know he just trusted his speed it, it's like what we said about bison robinson when we were doing his breakdown, like there are times where he kind of lost discipline, maybe didn't read the hole as good as he could and just tried to beat the defender outside over and over again. And some, and a lot of the time it worked, you know, and that's good. But, you know, that's something that he, you know, he needed to work on coming out of Juco, like just being a better, you know, um, or having better ball carrier vision. And then, you know, that agility as well. So those are the two biggest weaknesses for me. Like I said, I'm nitpicking. But what about y'all? I, I got to agree. I mean, <clears throat> the the only weakness really that I saw was, um, or not the only weakness, but w- one of the main weaknesses was like, he did look, he did look stiff coming out of the, coming out of the, uh, his burst. And while his burst speed is phenomenal, he he definitely went straight to like the end of his form right so he could get tripped up a little bit and he he could allow himself to to not like run shoulder first into into a hole you know where he could blast a defender back who's coming from the second level true um so i think that that shows maybe a little bit of impatience right like he's ready he's ready to go score right now so he's just trying to get to the end of his form and, and just blast off. Yeah, no doubt. I hear about you. you, Cody. So I think that one of the things that I noticed is while it's nice that he has good form, you know, when he's going down the sideline and when he's running in general, that's nice. But I think he started running too tall too early in a lot of the plays. Like, it looks like he's running standing straight up right in a lot of this juco film and like while that worked at the juco level you know and a lot of guys would just bounce off of him because he was just like his legs were so strong it just confuses me a little bit why he wouldn't get lower and you know we've seen his cuts we've seen his burst i know his legs are really strong and we'll see it a little bit here in the arkansas film but he could go through guys and he just wouldn't a lot of the time and I think playing lower would promote that. So he ran really tall and I feel like he bounced outside a lot and you'd miss holes, you know, like he would cut inside too, but I feel like he definitely missed out on even some potential touchdowns by bouncing outside instead, instead of cutting it back in. Mm-hmm. And then once again, this is just nitpicking quite a bit, but the ball wasn't always in the correct hand, you know? And <laughs> yeah, like, Obviously, it turned out like fine, but we'll see how that adjustment, you know, of him having the ball in the right hand the majority of the time affects his gameplay from Arkansas from Independence to Arkansas. 
you know, so like yeah. just having the ball in that outside hand, it statistically and technically and schematically speaking, it made a huge difference when he started to do that more at Arkansas. So those are oh. those are the weaknesses that I notice is it, like you guys said, it looking a little awkward, almost like straight out the gate. Um, oh. And so that that's me like commenting on him running pretty tall inside the box. Like, I don't mind him as much doing it against, like, safeties and cornerbacks. But inside the box, like, dude, like, lower. you're strong, okay? Like, sure, you're not, like, huge, but you're strong. So you can go through these guys, especially at the JUCO level. So, yeah, lower your shoulder, go through people, cut inside a little bit more, and put the ball in your right hand, like the correct hand. Gosh darn it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I I mean, I totally agree. And honestly, it's not that Rakeem Boyd shied away from contact. I felt like he was finishing off a lot of his runs. And it would it'd be pretty intense, too, when he's, like, at full speed and he lowers his shoulder into you. Like, that's 215 pounds going, oh, my gosh, and who knows what at you. And so he would be able to finish his runs. It's just, like, I mean, like you said, like, I don't know why like he just didn't put down his shoulder enough initially i guess you know like he was always trying to like out finesse somebody it felt like if that makes sense yeah for sure i think it makes know? perfect sense um, and you know in the so in last chance you this isn't a spoiler but coach brown uh jb jason brown he did say that you know rakeem boyd to him was like a leonard fournette type just naturally talented you know having all the speed having all the strength would i compare him to leonard fournette probably not because leonard fournette especially in college was notorious for being physical at all points of contact in the field like it doesn't matter if you got him in the backfield he will lower his shoulder and run you over and it was with malice for sure you know and i really kind of do feel like that rakeem boyd probably could channel his inner leonard fournette if he wanted to college wise that is but you know we'll get to that when we talk about his uh arkansas film yes sir so does anyone have anything else to say about rakeem boyd at independence i we're all in agreement that he didn't he was well above the uh level of juco right oh for sure absolutely i mean for him it was just one of those things where he just needed another opportunity that's it for sure so coming up rakeem boyd college film reactions from arkansas welcome back everybody welcome back to the playmakers corner we're going to be going over Rakeem Boyd's Arkansas film. Does anybody have any uh, knee-jerk reactions from watching it? I'll go ahead and go first. Um, something that popped off immediately to me that I put as my first strength was he was never tackled by the first guy that put his hands on him. Yeah, It always took more than one person. And I mm-hmm. think that a lot of that is attributed to the change in facilities from a JUCO to a division one school. Now I, I know it's still Arkansas, but it's there. The difference is there, the, in the trainers, in the weight room, in the equipment, in the science, you know, the health science behind it. He was, he got a lot thicker, I would say. And that, you know, while that, that's a strength here and never being tackled by the first guy. I'll talk a little bit about how it kind of became a weakness, but yeah, he was never tackled by the first guy. And then the other thing that I want to say was his ball security. He had his arm locked around that ball and it was in the correct hand. And I talked about this on the last segment. I'm going to talk about it again on this segment. When he was at independence, he fumbled the ball three times in one season. Okay. And he lost one of those fumbles. You know how many fumbles he's had at Arkansas in two years? Uh, Zero. Zero fumbles in two years at Arkansas. And that's, uh, like, I think a lot of that is, A, from him getting stronger in the weight room, and B, from holding the ball in the correct hand. I saw it in the correct hand basically every play, and his ball security is some of the best that I've seen. So, just... Once, once again, I love bringing this up. 
every like 120 to 150 carries or touches, I should say, a running back will fumble the ball in the NFL. With the exception being, you know, Christian McCaffrey fumbles once every like two to 250, 300 touches. Rakeem Boyd in over in nearly 350 touches over two years in the SEC has not fumbled once. And he's played Bama twice. So, I mean, he is he is in a committee, which is cut down on his carries. But that is still very impressive ball security to me, especially in the SEC. And then I'd want to say strength. I wanted to talk about him in the pass game just a little bit. Uh, he hasn't gotten a ton of chances to be in the pass game, but his hands are good. He catches with his hands. He doesn't catch with his body which is encouraging to see because that means that he'll drop the ball less. And he also has good spatial awareness. There is one play in particular that stood out to me when I was watching this film with Liam where, you know, he he stays in pass block for a second, checks to make sure nobody's coming through on a blitz. And then when he splits off, he splits off just where he needs to be to catch the ball as a check down and get the first down and some more. And I think that he also shows good field awareness when he's catching screens as far as following his blocks and where to cut to as well. And also on flare routes and even on wheel routes, just knowing where the defenders are and where the grass is. You know, there's some receivers that will run routes right into traffic, right into defenders. And that's like, it's hard to coach awareness. It's something that comes basically from yourself as far as studying film and knowing your tendencies and then be able to correct on that. And that is something that I think Rakeem Boyd has is that discipline and that desire to get better and to constantly be getting better in every aspect of his game, right? And that is something that immediately jumped out to me was, you know, he he got smarter at Arkansas and stronger. So those were the things that immediately jumped out to me. And he was, he became a much better player at Arkansas in these past two years. And I'd say even better from, you know, he increased dramatically from 2017 to 2018 and he increased even more from 2018 to 2019. And I'm excited to see what 2020 has in store for us. Maybe. Yeah. All right. What about you, Liam? Take you want me to go? Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, yeah, I have to, I just, I can, I think I can only really just emphasize exactly what Cody said. And that's, he fixed almost everything that we were seeing that was quote unquote wrong at last chance of you, or uh, not last chance of you, but you know, at, at, at independence. Um, and he's kicking butt and he was, he's getting a, a few more looks. I think I can't remember exactly. I think he gets more looks in the passing game than uh, he was at independence. But he is the star of that offense. And he is not only just the star, but he's able to at least be reliable. And he's able to be good even when their team is losing. And they're probably passing it 40 times a game. He's still getting runs that break for 60 yards, 40 yards, a touchdown, uh, a 20-yard touchdown or something. And he's making things happen. And that's awesome to see, especially, you know, with a low scoring offense like Arkansas had and especially going up against good defenses. All right. So, yeah, no, he's improved a ton for sure. I'm look, I got to bring up the, the level of play because I brought this up at Indy. So I feel like it's fair to bring it now that he's in the SEC and it's not just the SEC, but. I mean, look, you got to keep in mind the kind of defensive players in the SEC for sure because he's went up against the likes of Alabama, Georgia, LSU, this past LSU, like, like, oh, my God, and then Auburn as well, and all of these great, you know, SEC teams that have really tough defensive lines. And to keep in perspective, I'm pretty sure Arkansas has not sent one offensive lineman to the NFL in the last two years. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah, or even like got alignment to the NFL, like as a practice squad player, to be honest. So that should tell you how good this Arkansas O line is because they're not, they're not good, you know. And the fact that Rakeem Boyd 
has had a 1,000 yard, well, over a thousand yard season against, you know, playing in the SEC against some of these SEC teams with a terrible O line, with, to be honest, really no passing game, also no defense either, uh, <laughs> says a lot. Because he's single-handedly carrying this Arkansas team. Obviously, he can't do everything because if you're a running back and you're the only good player, then that just means other teams are going to stack the box and beat you up every game. But he still makes it happen. you know. And I personally think that Rakeem Boyd has definitely become a lot more physical playing in the SEC than he did um, on the Juco level, for sure. Now, maybe he was a little bit slower, for sure. I think the agility thing is still kind of a problem, but... I like the physicality at the point of contact for sure. Much more, you know, in his Arkansas days than his Juco days. You know, like there are times where, I mean, because he has no choice. Like he'll just get swamped by two or three defensive linemen before he even gets the ball. But he will lower his shoulder or whatever and find a way to make something out of it. You know, and so he's becoming... I guess he's becoming much better at breaking tackles like that at the point of contact, at the point of getting the handoff and whatnot. And honestly, I, he's getting better. You know, and obviously the speed is still there. Maybe he lost a step or two, but that's not, you know, that honestly, that's not the biggest thing if he's still producing on the field. Because, like I said, this isn't a talented Arkansas team, and they're not going to be talented this year if they play. So the fact that he continues to succeed is a really big deal because you really don't see many running backs succeed like that with a terrible team because they really do rely on a lot of people to be good. So that's really impressive to me. And honestly, some of the big games he had, like against Alabama, pretty sure he had, if I remember correctly, over 100 yards and two touchdowns in one of the games he played against them. And then I think he got just under 102 in another. But yeah, so he's produced in big time games for sure. And he continues to get challenged. And, you know, if you want to look at the list of defensive players he goes, he he's went up against, it's really impressive because you could basically list off the whole LSU and Alabama roster and then throw in some Georgia and Auburn and Florida players. And that's a... That's a pretty impressive list of defensive linemen that Rakeem Boyd has went head to head with and still produce, you know. So honestly, that's really all I gotta say. I'm gonna be honest, like I <laughs> like I really wanted Rakeem to succeed, but when I saw that he chose Arkansas, like obviously they they have a history of developing running backs. A, I would say a pretty solid recent history with Peyton Hill, Derek McFadden, Felix Jones, even, you know, but I didn't expect him to be as good ha as he is right now. And so this is really good uh, for, Rakeem, for Rakeem Boyd, honestly, because he's also kept or stayed pretty healthy despite, you know, getting beat up all the time uh, by multiple players in the SEC. So, yeah. All right. So let's talk weaknesses. Who wants to go first? Cody, Liam, or I can. I can go what first. Go first? Oh. Okay, go for it. So, as far as uh, weaknesses go at Arkansas, I still think that he runs pretty tall. Um, that's one thing that he hasn't really worked on too much, and maybe that's just because it hasn't been pointed out to him. But between his increase in strength and his increase in IQ, I feel like if he runs lower, he could be – I think it could move him up a whole round in the draft. And we'll talk about what we want to see, right – as far as in increasing his draft stock and kind of our thoughts on it. But I think if he runs lower, you know, I mean, low man wins. Simon, I don't know if you were told that like literally every snap in practice, but yes. I was brought up on low man wins. And like when, when I was, <laughs> when I was first playing football in middle school as like a fullback, I had to live by that. Cause I wasn't a big kid and our team wasn't big and I had to play fullback. So like, it was all about being low for me. And that's where I was able to excel was, I mean, I was short, so I was already low to the ground, but like, you know, mm -hmm. playing the leverage game. And I, and I preach that to my players even now. Right. So he still needs to bring down his shoulders just a little bit and bend at the knees and just inside the box. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's fine. If you start running tall outside of the box, when you get past most of the traffic, but I think if he, stays lower inside the box he'll push piles not only two yards 
but four or five yards, you know, because he's good at chugging his legs once he gets wrapped up. But if he runs just lower, people will bounce off of him in the first place. So I'd also say that a weakness that I noticed for Rakeem Boyd at Arkansas is I think that his weight fluctuation and his strength fluctuation kind of messed with his speed a little bit because, you know, I mean, it's different when you put on a bunch of weight, right? And I think that he'd look a little awkward, you know, like, you know, that that kid that hit his growth spurt too fast or something. And I think that he needs to get used to, and I've even seen some reports that he's pretty comfortable at the weight that he's at now. But I think that he had trouble finding a comfortable playing weight and size, I guess. And that was something that I noticed. And that's not really a fault of his own. You know, that's just something that you learn as you grow, right? And something that could be easily fixed, in my opinion, right? But something to definitely keep an eye on is what do I look like right at at this weight and what does it feel like for me and my body? So just knowing his body and definitely figuring that out. And then this isn't really a weakness. I mean, there's concerns about his pass blocking, right? But I think that if he just gets more involved in the pass game and that's up to Arkansas and the coaching staff, right? I want to see him more in the passing game because he's so good at it. So, you know, I'd like to see him pass block some more. And I think that'll help teach him to play low. You know, especially if you have SEC edge rushers coming at you, like you're not going to be able to stand up and take them on. They're going to go through you. And I think that that is another huge difference for him uh, moving on up is, you know, and learning how to play low is playing in the passing game and being able to block. And if he's able to block in the pass game, then I think that'll open the door for him to catch more passes as well so that he's not like a liability in protection if they need him. Yeah, no, for sure. So game, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, it's really hard to say. I think I do agree with everything that you said, Cody, like pass blocking is, is massive, especially for uh, running back. Oftentimes running backs are the last line of defense um, in a pass blocking scenario. So it, it'd be good to see him more in that role. Uh, and like all the best, all the best running backs have to be good at pass blocking. Like I bet you Todd Gurley just, you know, he probably runs, I'm not sure how many he does anymore now that he's kind of taken an edge off of his uh, uh, game. But, you know, I bet at his, at his prime, Todd Gurley was running a bunch of plays every day where he was just saying, okay, come at me and I'm going to try and stop you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh. Uh, so that's all good stuff. I think his, his weakness definitely is. I'm going to say it's maybe a speed cap. I think he might have a speed cap. And as we go further into maybe like the NFL, he might, I don't know. I don't think he has bad speed by any means, but he might meet his match as far as that speed goes. And with his improper, maybe not improper technique, but with his, uh, with his a little bit, a little bit of the stiffness that we've talked about, a little bit of that, that hesitancy to, um, to lower himself, that could get him into some bad situations where his speed finally isn't able to carry him to victory. But yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. That makes sense to me. I agree with both of y'all. He has a lot. I mean, okay, I wouldn't say a lot, but he has a solid amount that he could definitely improve on. And it's not like it's, you know, completely out of reach. Like there's a lot that he could work on for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with his speed, that's an interesting thing because I, I don't know. Like I said, I'm still not sure how fast he actually is. And whatnot, you know what I'm saying? Because looks could be deceiving. So I think, I mean, okay, here, I'll, I'll save that for the next segment and whatnot. But I do think that uh, it would do him some good to time himself and make sure that he's consistently hitting his top speed or at least doing that as fast as he possibly could. But anyways, I think with Rakeem, um, for me, it's still the agility. Like, I, <laughs> like I, need him to, I need him to get just a little bit better because – in college like you know his agility is working just fine for the next level 
I think he might just be a step or two a little bit too slow. And we'll get into comparisons pretty soon here because there's somebody that I feel like is always a step or two a little bit too slow. But if they're on it, then they're on it. You know, so I need to see that, you know, side to side lateral movement just get a little bit better. You know, I, I'd like to see that quickness for sure. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything spectacular, but just enough where he could do what he needs to do on that next level for sure. And, you know, I, I actually I have to agree with Cody about, you know, his body weight and I guess his um, body shape just in general. Like, I feel like I don't know, like. I feel like we haven't seen Rakeem Boyd in his absolute prime body wise, like in a body and weight that he feels absolutely comfortable playing in while being like in his prime physically. Do you know what I'm saying? Cause I've like you said, Cody, like his weight does kind of go up and down a bit and could be a little bit problematic. So for Rakeem, I think the biggest thing for him is to find that sweet spot. You know, where he could still run with power, but still be able to reach, you know, his top end speed uh, as best as he could. So, and, you know, honestly, that might be some discipline as well. You know, maybe he needs to discipline himself, right? Or have a coach that helps him out and figures out like where that sweet spot is. But I think that's kind of a weakness as well. Just that weight fluctuating and him not really like, I guess, settling into the body type that he feels most comfortable running at and that's hard for a running back because it's not like it's not the easiest thing you could find because once you get used to one uh style then even if it's not the best style for you it's hard to break because it's a habit you know Le'Veon bell he's someone in my opinion that had to go through all of that because that dude came out of college weighing 245 pounds and then he you know oh shredded God. down all the way to 215 210 that was the weight he was comfortable at but in college, they wanted him a little bit heavier. So with Rakeem, I think that's just something he needs to figure out because um, there are plenty of players who may have not reached their full potential because they didn't quite know what their prime uh, body weight or shape should be. So, yeah. Absolutely. And if that does it for... Does anyone else have anything to add on for weaknesses or strengths that we saw at Arkansas? Um, no, I don't. All right. Well, Simon, I'm glad that you uh, brought up a pro name because coming up on this next segment, we're going to try and tell Rakeem Boyd what we'd be looking for, for him to improve on his game and to increase his draft stock and some NFL comparisons coming up next. Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner Podcast. We're talking Rakeem Boyd. And on this last segment, we're going to be talking about what he can do to improve and some pro comparisons. So, Simon, you seem like you were eager to jump on to your comparisons and such. So, and as well as advice you'd give Rakeem. So what are some things that you're looking for Rakeem Boyd to do this year that maybe he hasn't done or some things that he can continue to improve on from a draft perspective and a scout perspective and some pro comparisons? All right. So, I mean, honestly, a lot of what I said before, like I'd like to see him settle into a comfortable body weight because, I mean, I'm because I'm reading some scouting reports and one of them, I mean, the first year head coach over at Arkansas, head coach Sam Pittman, he did say that he felt like Rakeem played a little bit on the heavier side as a junior. He was a, he was listed at 213, but I'm I'm just going to be honest. I feel like he was much heavier than that. Uh, well, maybe not much, but probably 220, 225, which might be a little bit too much for Rakeem. So I would like to see him settle in and find a good weight. He already has been slimming down. I think he's down to, or I guess his ideal weight is 206, and he's pretty close to that. And he was quoted. This is what he said. But he said, this year, I think I'm seeing a four-pack. I think I'm seeing a six-pack. Um, while joking about <laughs> his body on Zoom with some reporters. And he said, I've never seen one of those before on my body. My body has been different. I think I'm just ripping up or something. And that's a really good indication for me. Because that means he's finally slimming down. And, you know, just packing on muscle. Like, getting rid of that fat. 
you know, and just packing on muscle. And I think, you know, this, I mean, as bad as this whole COVID crisis has been, it's been a good opportunity for Rakeem Boyd to take the time to restructure his body type because that does take time. It's not a two or three month process. That's something that you really got to work on for close to a year sometimes, um, especially for guys like Rakeem Boyd. So that's a really big thing for me, just getting to that comfortable playing weight. And then, look, I'm just going to be honest. If he survives this season and he somehow puts up slightly better numbers than last year, and I'm saying this because, you know, the SEC is probably going to play only SEC games, so they're not going to have any of their cupcake games to start or, you know, in the middle or end or whatever, I would be honestly pretty impressed. I would think he's a borderline first-round pick. Now, right now, I think at the highest, he could possibly go late second, maybe mid second. And that's reaching a bit because I know there are some really good running backs in this next class, like Travis Etienne, who I think is much better than Rakeem or has shown that he's been better than Rakeem Boyd in the past. But, you know, you never know. Maybe there's a team that really likes him and thinks he fits well with their system because he is a run cut. uh, Sorry, a one cut running back. So. You know, it's just one of those things. But yeah, you know, finding that right body weight, succeeding this season if there is one. And then lastly, just getting a little bit more agile, which kind of, you know, plays in with having the w- right body weight and uh, body shape as well. Uh, just because I think it could be real lethal if, you know, if if that agility, if that lateral quickness was a little bit better. But anyways, I'm going to talk... Oh, man, I'm going to talk comparison. It was a little bit hard, but I think, oh, my gosh, it's tough. I'm not going to lie. It was kind of tough for me, but I think his his ceiling is is top end Derek, Darren McFadden. You know, he was an Arkansas running back, too. They had, kind of have similar running styles, similar body types, and I think top end Darren McFadden, as in, like, maybe prime Darren McFadden, is what he can be, um, but possibly even better because he could be more consistent. So I think that for sure. I think low end, um, I could kind of see. I don't know, man. Like I could see a little bit of Carlos Hyde for sure. Because in my opinion, Carlos Hyde has always been just a slight step too slow, you know. But when he gets going, he could get going. He doesn't have the kind of speed as Rakeem Boyd. You know, but he was, I don't know. I just feel like Carlos Hyde was a little bit too slow. Not prime Carlos Hyde, probably lower end Carlos Hyde. So, you know, a solid rotational type of back. Like somebody that, you know, you could throw in there and uh, as a backup or third string guy and he wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't screw up. You know what I mean? He, he'd be okay. So that's what I think of Rakeem Boyd. I think he's too talented to not. You know, be one of those rotational type of guys, at least, even if he doesn't improve at all and stays where he's at right now. Um, so, yeah. What about y'all? Lay me mind if I go ahead. No, go ahead. So, Simon and I, we've talked about it on the last segment. We talked about it on this segment. Finding that ideal body weight, I think, is the most crucial thing that Rakeem Boyd needs to do. And I'm glad to hear those reports that he's he's feeling this way right now at 205 and i personally think that that's fine for him and even if he's a little bit lighter i don't think it's the worst thing in the world but i would like it to be mainly muscle right and we i think that i think finding the right body size is going to fit it's going to fix the other problems right as far as like running awkward or you know stuff like that if that makes sense So I think that's going to solve uh, a lot of his other issues. I think that also, I talked about it a little bit in the last time. I want to see him catch more passes. Not because I don't think that he can, but I think for him, it would be more beneficial. Like I said, get in there so that you can pass block. And so that way, when you're in there on third down, it's not a dead giveaway that, you know, you're going out for a route rather than just pass blocking. But I think that'll help his stock a whole bunch to show what he can do with the ball in his hands in space because he's very capable in space, especially if he shaves down some weight and he and he can run a bit more like he did at Independence even, where he has that one cut and then he has that quick burst. I think that that would be huge for, for him to do. 
Now, as far as uh, pro comparisons go, I think that as far as running styles go and that one cut ability and also just like kind of that passive strength goes, I see a lot of prime Jonathan Stewart from back with the Panthers and those first few seasons Ooh, just because nice. yeah because Jonathan Stewart you know he was just strong enough to get out of the like as far as the first guy never being able to tackle either of them like the resemblance is uncanny right it always took more than one person for Jonathan Stewart but I think something that Jonathan Stewart also kind of struggled with is I think Jonathan Stewart was a bit on the heavier side and he ran kind of awkward sometime so I think it at least as it got down the road. So, you know, slim down, peak shape. Jonathan Stewart also could kind of catch out of the backfield, make moves in space, and ran. He ran taller, if that makes sense. You know, really pumped those knees and really pushed, if that makes sense. As huh? far as uh, low ceiling goes, don't overreact to this. I'm going to say Frank Gore, but older Frank Gore, if that okay. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> older older frank gore so i'm Makes talking sense. i'm talking buffalo frank gore you know rotational guy is yeah. what you mean yeah, yeah. rotational okay. uh will take care of the football for you you know you don't have to worry about rakeem giving away the football reliable right you know you could count on him for probably three yards pop and you know an occasional first down you know if if it's short he'll he'll get the first down for you he'll find a way and he'll work hard and arguably be a leader. You know, he's he's had to work through a lot and he's been through a lot of different scenes. And I think that he could bring that on as a, as a floor, as an older Frank Gore. That rhymes. So, um, <laughs> Rakeem Boyd's floor is an old Frank Gore. Remember that. And, you know, I'd still feel happy drafting him in the fourth round, you know, at his floor or even the fifth round. And at his peak... You know, if he takes a huge step like Simon and I were talking about and he improves in those areas and he looks comfortable in his body, I'd say that he could move up to a second round, late second round guy, maybe even middle at, at his absolute peak. I'll pass it over to Liam now, though, to see what his thoughts are. Yeah, I I really don't disagree with anything that you guys said. I mean, it's he's got a lot to work for four and he's got a lot to work towards but he's got such a great base already that i think he's going to be totally fine it's it's hard to i don't know he's such a he's such a pure runner that i feel like there's almost there's there's it's hard to make comparisons um in my mind it's what's really gonna designate him is his um his pass catching ability and his pass blocking ability in my mind, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of pure runners. So you could just say you, you could almost drop names and just be like, yeah, I, I could see that in my mind. Um, but to, so my, my, in my mind, the, the clearest things for me is he could be like less of a pass catching um, Dalvin cook or more of an Adrian Peterson type. Okay. I see if that. That makes sense. Um, and if he can increase his pass catching abilities, if he can become a third down back where he, you know, blocks and then runs out for a flat, he could easily be Dalvin Cook in my opinion. He's got the speed. He's got the top end speed. Maybe he's a, maybe he's a step behind like a Dalvin, but he's I think he's got a little bit more strength. And so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see where he goes. As far as floor, uh, I don't know. I don't really like assigning like a floor. So I'll pass on. <laughs> I mean, I'll pass on that. That's fair. Oh wait a second! You can't pass. I mean, a floor is tough, know. but a floor is hard. Way harder than a ceiling. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I mean, what if, what if you put it into like quantity, you know, or like a roll? Yeah, yeah. In how about, how about that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay, then he would definitely be like a run by committee type, almost um, to go by today's standards, probably more of like a uh, Rolls Royce with a few okay. a few years fewer on him at this point. That's actually pretty good. That's a good comparison yeah. because Royce uh, Royce's injuries has attacked his burst quite a bit, but he can still hit the hole and get you a few yards. So yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he, he's you know he's decent in pass coverage. He's decent in, in passing. 
um, situations. So I don't know. That would be like, but Royce Freeman, if he's probably where he is right now on the Broncos, I would say that's his floor. And that's not a that's not a dig at Royce Freeman. I think he's just surrounded by at the moment better running backs, and will probably be traded at some point to another team, and he'll get another chance there. Uh, but not to put make this all about Royce Freeman. Yeah, no, for sure. So we're all in agreement that Rakeem Boyd is most likely a pretty good rotational running back at the very least on the NFL level. That is, so not CFL, XFL. But on the NFL level, he's a solid rotational guy at the very least, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. At the All very right. least. Yeah, for sure. And look, he is, honestly, he's just naturally talented. Like, he's a, I mean, he's kind of a freak of nature. It's kind of crazy how he hasn't found that, you know, natural weight or body shape for him yet. But he's still doing pretty well. That's just, that's just a testament to how good he is. So, Honestly, that's finding that body weight and shape. It's not the biggest thing to worry about, you know, like he either finds it or he doesn't. Either way, he's going to be successful in in more ways than a lot of people are at that level. So, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. All right. Well, any last comments on Rakeem the Dream Boyd? Keep dreaming. <laughs> dream oh. on dream on every time every time i one of his games i'm just gonna play play that song every single time people will be like what are you watching i'm just dream on oh man oh. can't wait for y'all to get to the season with rakeem boyd because I, I mean i don't know i feel like we didn't really talk about his personality a ton but it's interesting to see what he had to you know what he had to work through just at independence because yeah just because of jason brown and the culture that was cultivated there but that might i mean i don't know that season might have to be up next to be honest so we'll see yeah we'll see yeah all right so if that wraps that up (laughs) thanks for listening to the playmakers corner podcast make sure you follow us on instagram facebook and twitter and also if you are listening to us you've already found us on one of the major streaming platforms that is spotify apple podcast uh google podcast and youtube as well or anchor and make sure to share us give us some love give us a great rating if you have any players you want us to cover or do a breakdown of dm us and you know, we'll get the film and do that breakdown. And if we could talk with that player and have that player onto the podcast as well, so that we could have a little conversation, that would be great. But anyways, I am Simon Voyanos. I'm Cody Stoffer. And I'm Liam Hughes. Hi. Later. <laughs> <laughs>